good afternoon. Uh, it's, we have a small panel, but I'm sure it's going to be the most exciting. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you two of the biggest advocates of Greek food products and promoters in international markets, Ms. Natasha Linhart of Atlante SRL in Italy and Mr. Panagis Manuilidis of Odyssey Limited in the UK. Natasha, you want to go ahead with your presentation? Um, you can go to the podium. I hope, yeah. Whatever you prefer. We're going to have two short presentations and then we're going to have a discussion. Good morning to all. Lovely to see you here. And it's a fantastic honor for me to be here. And first of all, I wanted to thank uh, <clears throat> our Greek partner, Greek Krikri, for having chosen us and invited us to take part in this uh, very important uh, uh, meeting today in which we really want to honor um, Greek food in general. So, uh, yes, can I go ahead here? Can, uh, is there something? This one? Okay. So I'll just take you through a couple of slides. I don't want to bore you, but uh, just to let you know the kind of journey that we've been on over the past few years. Over the past three years, I think all of us have been very much involved in um, a lot of issues and complications which have made our uh, work extremely uh, challenging. We've had uh, inflation and recession, we've had climate change, we've had the war, we've had interest rates going up, and your uh, previous uh, debate on, uh, with the banks, I'm sure, have spoken about that. Uh, unemployment, overemployment, uh, commodities uh, flying off the roof, so really difficult, very, very difficult situation. And I think going forward, uh, looking at what the experts are going to say, this year is going to also be complicated in different ways, but one thing is that we, we learn how to manage complications. So how can we go forward? We've become sort of um, used to this situation and the next step is going to be for us all to be able to predict a little bit the unpredictable. In the, in the last few years we were put in situations with our shoulders against the walls, we didn't know what to do and we just acted out of impulse. Now we really have to become um, better at what we do, we have to manage um, relationships with our customers, with our producers, with the farmers, with everybody in such a very uh, different way as we did in the past. Uh, so uh, again, you know, we, we talk about globalization, but nothing is global anymore because all our uh, problems uh, extend beyond our, our immediate, uh, let's say, borders. So uh, we know very well and we have learned that just in time culture, and we know it because we've seen our customers who were used to reducing costs to the very bare minimum by having a just in time culture is no longer affordable. We've seen in the past year that in terms of food, um, the fact of actually managing to have the product on the shelf uh, was more of, a, of an issue than, uh, than, than managing the price. Then obviously both of them were difficult. We've seen how uh, the, the unfortunate situation in Europe with the war has created uh, a massive disruption all over the world. Uh, we've suddenly realized how dependent we are on, on Russian gas and energy. Uh, we work, I work in Italy and Italy is massively dependent on, on energy from, from Russia. So again there we're living a situation where we saw in July, August last year that uh, the, the Dutch uh, stock exchange uh, told us that the energy was just absolutely crazy for all factories. And this was a massive problem. Fortunately, things have gone down, but we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we really have to have to be very careful not to, to manage now a situation where there are possibly some um, improvements, but we don't know what's happening around the corner. So we saw that everything was a problem last year from uh, grains to oil to steel to raw materials of all sorts of problems. And suddenly, again, you know, as I mentioned before, we're aware of how dependent we are 
on energy from other countries. We never thought about this in the past. So we really, really do believe in the value of win-win relationships uh, based on trust and respect. And, and trust and respect are easy words that you can say um, that that's what you desire, that's what you want. But they have to be built over time. And uh, uh, with Cri Cri, we have really developed this, uh, this value where we trust each other in what happens. And this, in my view, <clears throat> will be the only way for us to work together uh, in such a complicated future. So just to give you a little bit the journey that we've been on with Cri Cri, we started uh, many years ago, five years ago, and, and we launched uh, uh, a few yogurts, uh, and then we've worked together mostly to understand, and this is something that really we need to do with all producers, Greek or non-Greek, we really have to understand how you can uh, sort of seduce the market that you want to be in, because yes, we want to sell authentic Greek, Greek products, uh, but actually there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done to make sure that your product is fit for the country. And I don't mean that one has to change radically the, 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 the core principles of a certain product, but you have to make sure that the product is right. I remember there was one uh, incident in which we, we worked on the flavors of uh, a certain yogurt and we realized that actually the Greek flavor, the Italians didn't like it. So we had to go and find uh, uh, blueberries in Siberia to make sure that we had the right flavor. And we worked together with two R&D departments to make sure that our product was absolutely right. We moved on and we, we thought maybe Greek yogurt so successful, we could start working with uh, Cri Cri on the ice cream project. And this has really moved forward in the last three years. We've worked together on developing all sorts of um, challenging products. It's taken us, uh, uh, and you will remember, it's taken us almost two years to find the right biscuit for the Italian market. So. Uh, and hopefully we've got it right for this year. So, absolutely. So I think that this journey will teach us all that whatever we do has to be done together in collaboration and taking advantage of each other's skills and assets. So this is our boat, and I call it a boat because in the last, uh, a yacht more like, it's a beautiful yacht, uh, with an Italian flag and a Greek flag on it, uh, uh, in which we are mature and responsible and we can navigate very difficult waters. Hopefully the waters will calm down a little bit, but in order to navigate this kind of boat uh, across the sea from Greece to Italy, we need experienced sailors. And I think we have it in our company and in Cri Cri, so we're good sailors. So Greece, I mean, Greece is... Uh, has always been an incredibly uh, rich country in terms of history and in terms of wealth, uh, and we all recognize that. I mean, the mythology of, of, of Greece is everywhere. We studied it, all of us uh, studied the Odyssey and Ulysses and all the lovely adventures of, of the Greek myths. Uh, um, but all of this has brought us also a tremendous wealth in the gastronomical arena of Greece. So yes, we are experienced in yogurt and, and uh, we, we, we buy feta, a lot of feta from Greece, but I think there is much more, much more from Greece that can come. Greece is a fantastic place, which is uh, on one side, it's the lovely sea and the sun, there's the big mountains, then on the other side, it's the barren lands to the east. So. There's a lot to say for, for Greek cuisine, and I think that uh, we at Atlante, we're totally passionate about food, so we really want to develop this um, representation of Greece in Italy um, on a much broader spectrum, and I'm sure that the Italians can easily fall in love with, uh, with Greek food, because it's very similar, actually, the, the basic 
tastes, our olive oil, our cheese, our uh, the same kind of herbs, the same, same kind of flavors. Tomato is at the base of all our um, dishes, eggplant, uh, uh, pastry, cakes. Uh, so there's a lot in common. We're not talking about Chinese food. We're talking about Mediterranean wonderful food. So I'm sure that uh, uh, you know we want to be recognized in Italy as really the best in class representatives of Greece with regards to food and this will be our mission going forward. So thank you very much. And now I have the opportunity to ask you some questions. Uh, you both mentioned your journey with Greek food products and I would like to hear what you feel mo most passionate about or your challenges and what are your biggest achievements, but basically what you feel passionate about. Natasha? Food. <laughs> so food is definitely a passion and it always has been. Um, and also a passion I have is to really understand end-to-end -end supply chain. So really understand how food, how products are made. Um, and uh, understanding really how the raw ingredients combine with the talent and with the know-how of whoever makes them and puts them then on the table. So I would say that's the passion. With regards to challenges and particularly with regards to Greece, uh, um, I would say apart from the relationship we have with Krikri where uh, we, we speak the, the same language, I mean they, their language is Greek but we, we can speak English, I would say that one of the biggest challenges we've had with smaller producers is, is communication. Uh, Greek is written in another way, it's uh, spoken in another way, so to really understand uh, the needs and the requirements is sometimes a challenge. Uh, Natasha, you mentioned about win-win uh, relationships and I'm sure uh, it's not just with the suppliers, it's also with your clients. How do you bridge that and what is the importance of uh, trust and respect in all this? Uh, well, I think it all starts from uh, within the company. I mean, our vision is to be a place uh, where our colleagues love to work. Uh, and so this is the first step, to have passion within the company. The passion within the company then is uh, sort of by a process of osmosis is sometimes uh, uh, reflected onto, onto our business partners, whether they be customers or producers, I mean, we're all in the same boat. Uh, at the end of the day, we all have to try and make the, I mean, we're not uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, you know, we are buying and selling products and trying to make a little profit in the middle. But if, uh, if we can do this uh, in a passionate way and in an honest way and really uh, expressing the values of integrity, of uh, um, respect, uh, of inclusion, uh, all of this is what underpins our strategy of the company. So I would say that, uh, um, to go to your question, this is, this is how we do it. We start from within with values that I personally truly believe in and, uh, and uh, that somehow the other, others too, because at the end we're human beings and we all like those kind of values. And so when you find that they're possible to to work in an environment uh, uh, where these values are, are reflected, it's, it's better. Natasha, thank you for sharing this insight. It's very valuable to all of us uh, here. During the last few years, Natasha, as you mentioned, we experienced major crises. I don't want to name them. There were too many. Um, how do you see the business environment uh, developing? how these crises have affected demand and the focus of retailers and uh, consumers? Well, I mean, if, am I using this correctly? Yes? We can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me with this? Shall yeah. I go with this? So, uh, if we look at, uh, you know, what the experts uh, say with regards to the future, um, I'm talking about, you know, McKinsey and uh, Global Boston Consultants and all of these people. Um, Basically, they, they present three scenarios, what they call the soft landing, very soft landing. So this year already, everybody is, agrees, 
our countries and our governments are all perfect and they do great financial uh, fiscal uh, rules, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine kind of tapers off or, or doesn't really get any worse and uh, um, inflation goes down and recession goes down and, uh, and uh, each country starts going back to a GDP which is towards 2%, so fantastic. In that case, that's scenario one, but I think extremely improbable. Scenario two is that uh, something goes right, something doesn't go right. Uh, uh, and we hope to come out of this difficult, difficult situation where there's supply chain problems, there's commodity problems, there's uh, um, inflation, there's uh, cost of money and all of this. So this could go on for the whole of 23, 24. The really bad situation is that we don't manage it. All our governments uh, don't agree on anything. The war gets worse. Uh, and, and therefore, we can start thinking about coming out of this situation only at the end of 2025. So we're hoping in scenario two, which would be not bad, um, I think we've got another year in front of us which is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, we were talking last night about the management of expectation of deflation is almost more difficult than managing inflation. So I think our customers now are all very anxious uh, to, uh, to see an inversion of the tendency of prices. So, uh, and also our final cons consumers, we see that uh, volumes are going down. Eh? I mean, when you have a, an inflation of 20, 30% on certain products, on some products, 50%. We saw Feta last year was uh, out, of the, out of the roof. Uh, um, and people can't afford it because salaries are still more or less unchanged. So I think that we're going to have to manage a question of volumes this year, um, see where they go, try and pick areas of success and go ahead with the areas of success. On environmental sustainability and ESG is, is, increasingly, is becoming increasingly a big issue. And how do you see this affecting the food industry? Um, yes, this is definitely um, a topic which all of us have to take into consideration going forward. I mean, when uh, in the past n there was a total unawareness of what we do and the impact of what we do on the environment. So definitely each one of us will have to, within Europe in any case, we also have to have, uh, as from 2025, I think, a sustainability balance sheet at the end of the year for all our companies. Uh, um, so this will be definitely uh, an objective which uh, is, is important. But we also have to transfer what we say we're going to do from paper, from theory to practice, even if it's very small tasks. Uh, and I think even the smallest production company should uh, single out what it really can do and do it. Uh, in our company, we have decided, and we work with about 170 different producers, so we have to make sure that all of them are doing a little bit to contribute in some way to the say, sustainability of the planet. For us in Atlante, we've basically <coughs> uh, created uh, three different pillars. One is uh, the environment and CO2 emissions. So basically that's very much connected to supply chain. So we're trying to improve the um, loading of all the, of all the trucks, make sure that they're all full, not waste any space. Uh, uh, we're trying to transfer whatever we can by train as opposed to road, um, by ship uh, instead of road. So we're doing a bit of work on that and already that has given us some um, advantages. We're working with producers uh, to see what their impact is and possibly favor, um, uh, you know, favor their projects. Then we're working on products. So on products meaning uh, not only packaging, even though that's an important part of it, so reduction. We know that with Cricri, -Cri, in the last couple of years, we've reduced uh, the, the plastic in the pots, and, the, and it's, I can't remember the, the volume, but it's, it's thousands of tons uh, of plastic which we've saved just by reducing the thickness of the pot. 
So packaging is one, uh, one uh, account, but also the nutrition and uh, the value of the actual products, uh, the, the goodness of the products. So, so in, line with, uh, uh, in line with expectations of what we're going to be in 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we need a lower calorie count, we need a higher protein count, uh, we need uh, to, to avoid any kind of uh, preservatives which uh, could be unhealthy, so we're working on product. Uh, the third pillar is people. So this is much more of an ethical part. So people, starting from our people within our company, we want a policy of inclusion, we want a policy of favoring the development of women within our company, we want to make sure that there is a plan, a specific plan for women who come back from maternity leave and uh, are welcomed back into the company as real members of the team, uh, and not just as second-class citizens who, poor ladies, they've just had a baby, so they're not worth uh, the position. So the position of women is extremely important, open to all kinds of nationalities. In our company, we have 16 different nationalities. We have all the religions under the sun, uh, including none. So we're very inclusive and open uh, society. We work very much with... Uh, uh, making sure that some of our producers, especially in very rural areas, uh, respect the labor laws of the country. Um, so people is a very important part uh, in, in all senses. We work with companies in, in faraway countries like uh, in the Southeast Asia and Asia itself and where the rules are different, but we try to make a difference there too for the local people and the local population. So sustainability, I think, is something that is everybody must take very seriously, but must do and not just say they're going to do. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, I, I think one point to add to this is that actually, yes, one of the, the dilemmas we have is that we still have uh, our final customers uh, who struggle to make ends meet. Uh, and have a limited amount of money to do their shopping. And so for them, sustainability is too expensive. Uh, and that's the majority of the population, let alone outside of Europe. I mean, in, we know that in Europe, we have more or less 8% uh, of the family income which is spent on food, 8 to 10%, more or less. Uh, uh, if we go to places like Ethiopia, it's 95%. So, uh, sustainability, we're talking about it in Europe, uh, and already for us, rich Europeans, it's already an expensive topic. So yes, you were saying before, you know, the, the, um, the retailers, they, they're looking at price, but they still want it to be sustainable, so, <laughs> yeah. so it's, a difficult, it's a difficult conversation. It's a very difficult conversation. Uh, and one last uh, quick question. What is your advice to Greek food companies uh, in order to succeed in uh, global markets? Uh, short answer, Natasha. Well, I think that uh, Greek producers are blessed with the fact that you have basically good ingredients uh, and delicious products. So that should be the basis for success. So maintain delicious ingredients and uh, uh, wonderful final products. Uh, my advice would be to, one, learn English well. <laughs> Two, as um, my colleague here was saying, um, make sure that your companies have the right, not only the right certification, because the certification is important as a piece of paper, but actually that the process is are in line with what is expected from the, the retailers in other countries. You're a country which has, what, 8 million people? Uh, something like that? No, 7, 8 million 10, people? 11. Yeah, 10, 11. You can feed the world, actually, with your delicious products. So you go to countries like Italy, which has close to 70 million people, so 10 times as much. You go to the UK, the same, Germany, the same, France, Spain, all these countries which are close by, which are now open, even, even traditional countries like Italy, start thinking about eating something different to pasta 
and to their delicious products, but because the Italians have delicious products too. But they're starting to be curious. They come to, it, to Greece on holiday, they love it. They go back home and they say, ah, let's do the moussaka or let's do the, you know, the whatever the dishes are. So I think it's important if you can really create um, within your companies a food safety um, environment uh, which can make the retailers feel comfortable with the safety of your products. Uh, so that, I would say, is very important. <coughs> Natasha Panagi, thank you very much for a wonderful and very, very insightful conversation. I'm sure our audience and the people following us on streaming have, are really excited about it.
Thank you.